Hello again. Today I have a story for you from a far off land of Arabia. Yes, in this particular land in Arabia, there was a sultan. And this sultan was really committed to his people. He really wanted to find out what they thought of him. So he regularly made trips to the market. He would go down with his vizier and his royal guard and guard, and he would try to talk to people, just normal everyday people, the butcher, the baker, all those tea house owners. And always he asked them how they thought, what they thought of his rule, how they liked living in their kingdom. But everybody always had praise. Well, after a while, this sultan discovered that every time he went out on town, the grand vizier would go in front of him and he would tell all the people to make sure that they only say good things and that they never ask the sultan any annoying questions at all. And what's an annoying question anyway? So when the sultan discovered this, he said, okay, that's it. I will be going out into the city by myself in disguise. Oh yes, in disguise. And so the, the advisors, of course, the whole city council, they were, they were in an uproar. They wanted to stop him right there. He couldn't do that. What a danger. He said, well, if this kingdom is really as happy and appreciative of my rule as you all tell me it is, then there is no danger. And what about the sultan's good name, they said. What if somebody sees you? All they will see is that I care about my people. And he put on a long cloak with a hood and he left. He thought that maybe if the people didn't know he was the sultan, he would find out the truth. And oh yes, he found out the truth all right. First, he went to the market where he normally went with his vizier. But the people there were so different than they normally were. They jostled, they pushed him around. Somebody even tried to steal his change purse. The Sultan was quite shocked at this behavior. He didn't realize that people in his kingdom behave like that. He hid himself in an alcove right off to the side so that he could have had an uninterrupted view and hearing range of a good chunk of the market. And in addition, he could hear what people were saying in the nearby homes, as these were warm summer evenings and everybody's windows were wide open. And oh, the Sultan was sad. All his people were talking about were complaints. They were complaining about finances. They were complaining about indigestion. They were complaining about their wives. They were even complaining about the Sultan. So, sadly, he thought this cannot be the whole kingdom. There has to be a place where they're not so despondent. despondent. So, the Sultan went out into the neighborhoods. He went to the rich neighborhoods Oh, and all he heard was complaints. He went to the middle class neighborhood. All he heard was complaints. He ventured out into the poorer neighborhoods. All he heard was complaints. Well, he was just about to turn back to the palace when he heard singing. Singing? Yes. Yes, there actually was singing. He turned about and followed the sound. As he approached the poor hut, hovel, really, he saw a young man merrily singing while sewing a pair of shoes. A cobbler, said the Sultan. Of all people, the only happy person in my whole kingdom is a cobbler and a poor one at that, he said as he took stock of his surroundings. But he was determined 
to discover this man's secret. So he hunched over a little bit, he made his walk a little shuffly, as if he was an old man, and he approached the cobbler. He said, young man, would you have a glass of water for the poor old man, weary from his travels around the town? I seem to have lost my way, and I just need a place to rest. The cobbler happily complied. He led the old man into his hut. He sat him at the table where there was bread and water and said, please, father, take anything, have some water, have some bread, take some rest, relax. You're in good hands here. You can rest for as long as you need to. And then he went back to sitting on the stoop, sawing the boot, and singing. The Sultan observed him for a while, but then he just, he was so curious. He said, how much money do you earn? Is this a lucrative business you have here? Oh, yes, said the cobbler. I earn four pennies a day. That's a nice little sum if I say so myself. Four pennies a day, said the Sultan. And how do you live on four pennies a day? Oh, quite well. You see, I eat one penny. I repay the second penny. I lend the third penny. And I throw the fourth penny in the river. How does that work? said the Sultan. Those are riddles you're speaking. Just tell me plainly, how do you live on that? My dear father, you misunderstand. This is quite simple, really. The first penny I eat myself. I, that means I buy my own food with it. The second pay, penny I repay. I take care of my father who's taken care of me all these years and now it's my turn to take care of him. The third penny I lend. I feed my sons with the third penny. And that way, when they grow up, they'll take care of me. And the fourth penny I throw in the river. I feed my daughters with the fourth penny. And as you well know, they will someday leave me and follow their husbands. So I cannot possibly expect repayment from them. Oh, that's a wise way of looking at it, said the Sultan. I really like that. And then he decided he would reveal himself to the cobbler. So he threw off his hood and stood up straight and announced himself. Well, the cobbler was a little odd, but he was a practical man. He smiled and welcomed the Sultan in his house and his hospitality wouldn't be any different if he was a Sultan or an old man in reality. So then the Sultan said, I will give you a thousand silver coins for this wonderful riddle you have given me. All you have to do is promise me that you will not speak of this to anyone until you've seen my face a thousand times. I agree, said the cobbler, and he happily accepted a thousand silver coins. So the Sultan jauntily returned to the palace, all prepared for the council meeting the next morning, ready to give the counselors this riddle. So the next morning he announced, please tell me, how does this man distribute his finances? If he gives one pen, if he earns four pennies a day, he eats one, he repays one, he lends one, and he throws one into the river. Oh, the counselor scratched their heads. They thought about it for a long time. The Sultan had to extend the time they had, had to think about it to three days, and they still couldn't find the answer. Finally, when the third day was nearing to an end, the Sultan said to them, I cannot believe you, you cannot solve such a simple riddle. If you do not solve it till tomorrow, I will publicly disgrace all of you and throw you in jail. Well, 
The councilmen quaked in their boots. But it was the vizier who thought about it. And he thought, where did the sultan get this riddle? He was out on town by himself when he found the riddle. So there must be the answer as well out on the town. So he put on a cape with a hood and walked through the neighborhoods. And he walked pretty much the same path the sultan took. He went to the market and he went to the poor or to rich neighborhoods, the middle class neighborhoods and the poor neighborhoods. And he was just about to turn back just like the sultan when he heard singing. Aha, he said, there is my answer. So he followed the singing and sure enough, soon he found the cobbler. And he said, oh, may I rest my weary bones here for a moment? What makes you so happy? I just need some relief from all the drudgery of day to day and the hard burden of my existence. Oh, said the cobbler, I just keep a happy attitude and try to enjoy life from moment to moment. But pray, father, what? worries you so much that you walk the streets at night in search of an answer. Well, the vizier said, the sultan had given his councilmen this particular riddle about how a man who earns four pennies a day appropriates his wealth. And I cannot fathom what it means. Ha, ah, said the cobbler. I see, that's a riddle indeed. I would be willing to spend a thousand silver coins to find out the answer to this riddle. Well, said the cobbler, I happen to have the answer to this riddle. Why don't we trade? And so the vizier gave him a thousand gold. But before the cobbler gave up his answer, he said, but make sure do not mention to the sultan that you have spoken to me. Oh, when the vizier promised that he would never mention that he had spoken to the cobbler. He gave him the thousand silver coins and left with his answer. The next morning, very proud, he announced that he had discovered the answer to the riddle. And the sultan's immediate reaction was, The cobbler talked! How dare he! How dare he? He made he, he gave me his word of honor that he would not talk, and yet he talked. Bring him here. I bring him to me. Off with his head. I he has to have the just punishment. Bring him to me at once. And so they brought the poor cobbler right in front of the Sultan. And the Sultan said, How could you have broken your word? You gave me the, your word of honor and you broke it. Oh, said the cobbler, I did give you your, my word of honor that I would not reveal this, your secret until I've seen your face a thousand times. But in fact, before I gave away your secret, I didn't only see your face a thousand times, I saw your face two thousand times. And at that, he pulled out the bag of coins from underneath his lapel and spilt them all on the floor in front of the sultan. And here on each coin, the sultan face, sultan's face was clearly visible. The sultan liked this answer so much that he, in his joy and gratitude, gave the cobbler another thousand gold and sent him off on his merry way. tangled web of beliefs we lead. As you can see from the story, our Sultan, he took matters into his own hands because he no longer wanted to continue with the beliefs that he suspected weren't true. He believed that he was a good Sultan and he believed that the people loved him. 
But as doubt crept into his consciousness, he decided to test his beliefs, to see if they were true, and perhaps to change them if they weren't. He could have lived for many years having the erroneous beliefs that he started with, but he persevered and he discovered the truth. I've been reading uh, and listening to Morty Left, Left Cole, Left Cole, and he has some really interesting ideas about beliefs. As you know, I love talking about how we form beliefs and where do beliefs come from. Morty has some slightly different ideas, but very fascinated, fascinating. Morty states that all events have consequences, but events have no inherent meaning. That means that in the example, in the article that I read, the example was that a man had a dad that didn't support him. He didn't financially support him or his mother. And this act of not sharing his finances with his son and the woman that gave birth to his son, he was just committing an act. It wasn't, it didn't have any inherent meaning. But as the boy grew up, he grew up with all different beliefs that stemmed from this act. Beliefs about unworthiness, beliefs about, beliefs about life being too hard, beliefs about life being unfair, beliefs about men treating women badly. All of these beliefs, they did not actually come from the act of his father not supporting his mother. They came from the meaning, the conclusions that he drew from the beliefs. Humans are always looking for meaning in things, and that has helped us over thousands of years, many times, but it has also hindered us. Because sometimes when we look for the deeper hidden meaning in a certain event, later, after we assign that meaning to this event, we cannot actually see the event without the meaning. The meaning is always attached to that particular event. Yet events inherently have no meaning. The meaning is a combination of our past experiences, our parents' consciousness, what beliefs they have taught us, or even what beliefs we picked up through osmosis, just through society and being members of society. So the meaning is something that we attribute to events. Now values are also an interesting thing. Va values are beliefs about right or wrong. Some values that are deeper can seem immovable. They can seem like there is nothing that would change them. Yet, all values are only personal opinion, personal beliefs, things we've picked up along the way, and not necessarily true. And even if they are true, they're not necessarily true for everybody. So according to Morty, a belief is a statement about reality in, my, in our mind that feels true. A belief is the meaning that we give to meaningless events. A belief is something that, if you were to finish this statement, I am something, that's a belief, whatever you are, or people can't, whatever you believe people cannot do, that's a belief as well, or life is, whatever you think life is. Now values, beliefs about right or wrong, would start with parents should something or it is wrong to something. So you see there's so many of these beliefs that are in our consciousness that we don't even really consciously keep track of them. We just understand them as reality. But then it gets complicated because other people have different beliefs and that is their reality. And so in the previous years, it has been a very common thing to attempt to 
take our beliefs and apply them to other people's lives. But because we're not them, it doesn't work so well and often our advice cannot even be utilized by others. And then, <coughs> so what we learn is that we cannot enforce our own beliefs or our own values on other people's. Because even, even if you think about me, I'm an extrovert, somebody who's an introvert, none of the advice that I could give them would actually work for them because they don't even have the same personality or the same outlook on life. All of their advice would work for them, but not for me and vice versa. So I think in the big picture, what we're forgetting a lot of the time is that life really is a game. And the rules in this game of life are created by us. And they can also be examined by us and reevaluated by us and changed by us. We are the ones who create the game. So next time you're thinking about something being better or something being worse or something being more or less pleasant, think about it. It's just a belief. It's just a thought that you attached meaning to in a way that stayed with you, a deep meaning, a significant meaning. And then this preference is recorded, but preference has changed. So be pliable and play with your life because what you thought was right 50 years ago, 20 years ago, or even five years ago might not be true for you today. Of course, there's always others for whom it is true right at this very moment. Have a great week.